this letter from the Apostle Paul. We would know, you know, if we didn't know anything else about his character or his story or his past or even present when he's writing this um, situations, we would have a fantastic example of how to love, how to support, how to honour one another, to humbly serve. And we can really see his heart for the good for this church, can't we? You know, he, he includes instructions for them as to what to look out for, to be careful, to be careful, to be careful. That's, that's a new word. It's, cr- it's a cross between cautious and careful. You see what I did there? That's good, isn't it? Um, last week, we saw how Paul was reminding them that even though they had many reasons to boast about even though he had many reasons to boast about his upbringing, to boast about his intellect, his abilities, his obedience and dedication to God's law, and even Paul's zeal and holiness, he highlights, he points out that actually all of those things are completely useless if he doesn't have faith in Christ and depend upon him and Jesus' sacrifice for his sin, which I hope then caused us to examine our own hearts, perhaps our own trophy walls and achievements, to make sure that we pursue God's will in our lives and not our own, that we use those things which God has given us to bring glory to God and to serve his church. And last week, Paul addressed all those who thought that they could earn their salvation because of their trophies and achievements or law-keeping, or whatever it might be. But Paul himself, after listing off this huge long list, doesn't he, a list of reasons as to why he'd be first in the line of blamelessness, says that he isn't perfect. And he doesn't hold to false hope in his own righteousness, but it said that it was all rubbish. If you remember, it was the type of rubbish you throw, you flush down the toilet. Right? Com- when compared to Christ's righteousness and perfection in the eyes of God. So Paul's idea today is to call all those who think they've arrived at holiness and to give them instruction. And Paul does this in a way which includes himself. I really like this because he, he says things like, he uses phrases instead of saying, um, do this or let's do... He, Instead of saying, do this or do that, he says, let's do this. He includes himself. It's that terminology. He's including himself in this. It says in verse 15 there of chapter 3 that those of us who are mature think this way. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. He's including himself in this. And interestingly, Paul doesn't really use this type of language anywhere else in this letter. And Paul tends not to be known, well, he tends to be known for taking the ball by the horns, doesn't he? And, and saying how it is. Right, he, he far more often uses direct language of you do this or do that or some people are like this and they need to change. He's direct. And in most of Paul's other letters, he's very direct and to the point. But by using this less direct language that we're looking at this evening, Paul is being gentler. In, or more gentle in how he addresses them. And I think Paul does this because of the more sensitive issue of unity at the beginning of chapter 4, where he calls for like-mindedness in difficult situations beca- between two church members in particular. It says in chapter 4, verse 2, I entreat Eudia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And one thing that jumped out at me while Jules um, was reading that passage about people walking as enemies of the cross as enemies of Christ you know we often have that mindset of you walk through life you know the apostle Paul himself uses that terminology quite often you know run the race those sorts of phrases 
you know, people who are walking as enemies of Christ, it's not just a one-off mistake. It's not just a, a one-off bad decision or, or something that was said in the, the heat of the moment that has caused harm, which they can. You know, we can, we can spend a lifetime building up honor and respect and immediately lose it because of a stupid thing that we've said or a bad decision gone wrong. But walking as enemies of Christ, it's a day after day after day, conscious decision of deciding, I'm not going to do what, what God's will is for me today. I'm going to go against that for whatever reason. But these are believers who have had a disagreement. And the advice which Paul is giving is to be like-minded. The conflict between Judea and Syntyche is significant. I mean, it's clearly been a long-running conflict between these two ladies. Um, and the reason why I say that is simply because Paul has heard of it. You know, from prison, many miles away, and I googled this, there's different uh, opinions on it, but if you cross the Mediterranean Sea from Philippi to Rome, it's about 800 miles as the crow flies, so a direct line, 800 miles away, when Paul writes this letter to the church that it's going to. If you go by land, it's closer to 2,000 miles away. And Paul has heard about this little conflict. I mean, I call it little, it's perhaps huge. Yet despite the difference, Paul has heard about this issue. So Paul addresses this section of the letter by encouraging the women after calling attention to the conflict. Instead of casting blame on either of them, either one of them, Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't take sides. He addresses the conflict by calling them to a higher standard of Christian living. And it's interesting to me that he doesn't exactly solve the issue between these women. But what he does do is to provide the rules of engagement. Right? You've, you've heard of the, the military term, only fire when fired upon. You may have heard that. Um, if you've ever watched a war movie, you've probably seen that being displayed. The, the idea is that you need, as a soldier, you need to be able to tell the difference between a warning shot that's fired in the air, in other words, don't come any closer, I'll shoot you, compared to a shot which whips past you and you hear it, they're actually taking aim and firing at you, which then, according to the Geneva Convention, gives you the right to fire back. Those are the rules of engagement in war. Now, in the heat of battle, you have to be able to decipher that, which is hard. It's hard. But Paul's rules of engagement during the heat of conflict is unity in Christ. Unity in Christ-likeness, which should be the aim of every Christian, shouldn't it? And he softens the instruction on this argument by bringing himself into living that same standard. I think he's very wise on this subject. I think he's very wise in many subjects. But I'm so thankful to God for giving us this instruction. Because relationships are difficult, aren't they? You know, you, you can choose your friends but not your family. Yeah? <laughs> but what's important to remember is that your church is your family, okay? And it's made up of people that God has placed in your family deliberately and intentionally. I don't know how often you think about that, but every single person who worships with us on a Sunday is here intentionally and deliberately put here by God. I think that's great. I think that's challenge sometimes. But that's what Paul is saying. You know, and that's why I think it's such a shame when Christians hop from church to church to church. Because what they're trying to do is actually pick their family. Oh, we don't fit in that family. Okay, well, let's try and find another one. You know, well, we don't fit in in that family. I don't particularly get on with that person. All right, we'll try another one. And you see my point. He encourages them to find unity in Christ. It's finding that one thing which you can agree on. 
And that is that you both love the Lord and you both serve his purposes. Paul says in Ephesians 4 verses 15 and 16 that we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's what Paul is saying in Philippians as well, in Philippians 2, as in T-O-O, not Philippians chapter 2. Right, we need to be examples of Christ-like living, right? We also need examples of Christ-like living. People to look up to and to model our lives upon. And Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example in that. Philippians 3 verse 17, Paul says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the examples that you have in us. You know, when the church family has the same aim and the same focus of Christ-likeness, knowing that we're different, knowing that we have vastly different ideas sometimes as to how we should approach something, knowing that we're equipped with different skills and gifts, knowing we're cherished and loved perfectly by our Heavenly Father, we have the courage to let go of our own desires, let go of trying to be somebody in front of everybody, let go of people-pleasing and instead live in a way that, that pleases God, the audience of one. And as we serve the church and give of ourselves, our time, our gifts, our resources to encourage and build up the church in love, that is where we find our purpose in the sense that we are living for what God has designed us to live for with the support around us of the family that God has put in your path. I think it's great, isn't it? We're going to get into that a bit, bit, bit deeper in a moment. Let's read, uh, let's sing, actually. Um, oh, how the grace of God and loved with everlasting love. Thank you. Father, I thank you for the work that you are doing in this church. Lord, in this family that you have placed me and my family into. Lord, and that you have done that for so many. And Lord, as when my parents were here this morning, I was able to look around the room and just see with them the amount of people that you have brought in over recent months, even weeks, Lord, who were not worshipping with us a year ago. Father, we are so blessed. You have blessed us beyond our imagination. Lord, with that comes a responsibility, particularly for us who are perhaps longer in the faith, Lord, perhaps those who of us who have a greater spiritual maturity amongst us, Lord, that are able to use the gifts that you have already given us to help those new believers, and perhaps even those who are with us week after week who are yet not yours. Father, help us to see the need within our family, Lord, to reach out and to be willing to get down with the woodland animals. <laughs> Lord, be with those people, we pray. Father, you know each and every one. I won't list them off for risk of missing anybody out, but Father, I thank you for the way that you have blessed us in bringing so many in. Lord, you have blessed families by bringing husbands back to you. 
you have answered prayers that have been prayed for decades. Father, you are a faithful God and we trust you. We trust you with our lives. We trust you with feeding us. We trust you for our eternity. Lord, help us to live in light of all of that. Lord, and bring you glory in every opportunity we pray. Help us now as we look into this passage. And Lord, if there are if there is disunity amongst us, Lord, in this family that you have placed around us here, Father, may we tonight deal with that. May you challenge us that, Lord, we would put these things right before you and before one another so that we would be able to serve you more greatly and that the world would see that you are God. Lord Jesus, bless us now, we pray. Fill us with your spirit and help us, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, when we are seeking to resolve disagreements and looking to God to reveal the proper course of action, it's essential that we hold on to God's standards in that. There's, There's no room for backsliding. So the maturity we have becomes the new minimum standard, if you like, for our behavior, okay? And this is Paul's personal practice when it comes to conflict in his own life. We, we can't go through this passage and deal with conflict or, and unity without highlighting the fact that Paul had conflict and unity in his life, in his personal life. But he says these words in chapter 3, verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if if in anything you think otherwise, then God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. In other words, we must remain focused on Christ as our goal, as his glory as our goal, striving for everything that God has planned for us. And if anything or anyone has something else in mind or something else they're striving for, something less than total commitment, then God will clear that blurred version or vision, sorry. He'll make sure that you see it, that I see it, that we see it. But now that we're on the right track, let's stay there and keep going. We don't take a little diversion off the track so that we can have a conflict. Can you see my point? Or that we can deal with a conflict even. But Paul himself had issues with church members. He had a big disagreement at one point with a man named Barnabas. Now they disagreed about who they should take on mission with them. Um, Jules and I, thankfully, haven't had that disagreement. Should we take Oakley? I don't know. Um, um, You know, but they disagreed about who they should take. So there was this other gentleman whose name was John Mark, and Paul didn't want John Mark to come, and Barnabas did. And so there was a conflict in Paul's life, a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, It wasn't over doctrinal issues. You know, it wasn't over, well, did Jesus really rise again? You know, it wasn't a conversation like that. And often conflict within the church isn't doctrinal. It often isn't. Often conflicts within the church are a result of difficult relationships and more often personal differences. Maybe even harsh words that have been said and they hurt. The important thing to point out in Paul's disagreement with Barnabas is that neither Paul nor Barnabas let that conflict distract them from their efforts of spreading the gospel. Okay, and so this isn't just a theory, this is truth. If they are stuck on that track, as he's said there in verse 15, 
Let those of us who are mature think this way. If any one of you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Let us hold true to what we have attained. You see, Paul and Barnabas, they don't divert off that track. They keep going. The sad truth is that there will always be times this side of eternity when brothers and sisters in Christ will disagree in matters of opinion. Now, the important thing to keep focused on is the will of Christ. And, and the will of God, Christ would never be division of the heart towards another person or towards a group of people, because that's sometimes how it can be. I heard just this week of a church split that happened because after a church service, the, the, the congregation had a meal together and the pastor sat down and a child came over and sat next to him and the child had more ham on his plate than the pastor. And the pastor lost it. Right? That's not an issue of doctrine. That is funny, but it's also really bad and really sad. Isn't it? You see... The will of Christ would never be division of the heart towards another person or a group of people. And that's what Paul is saying here. Christ came to bring us to God, united in his body, to draw together a people for himself. In Acts, Peter says these words. I now truly understand that God does not show favoritism, but welcomes those from every nation who fear him and do what is right. He has sent this message to the people of Israel, proclaiming the gospel of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So you see, Christ's work on the cross has brought a vast variety of people, as vast as it gets, from all nations together to worship him in unity. That's what the cross of Christ has achieved. Now, I know there's been other cases of this example that I'm going to give you now, um, certainly in England, um, with the case between, uh, with the bakery, I've forgotten the name of it now, um, where they refused to make a cake for a certain person. And, um, but really, this all sort of goes back to a decision that was made in 1995 uh, in the Supreme Court in America. Now, you know how culture sort of works. You know, it starts somewhere and then it spreads a bit. You know, sometimes it will die very quickly. Other times it will drag on. And we're, us in America are a bit like that. There'll be things that come over and they influence us and we'll have things that influence them. But this was a big one, certainly in the, in the Christian church. So in 1995, the Supreme Court in America was forced or faced, sorry, with a decision that could have had enormous impact on religious freedoms in America and therefore in England and throughout the rest of the Western world, let's say. The news article that I found read as like this. Texas school officials have refused to rent a building to a church group because they feared objections and lawsuits from aggressive forces that hound conservative Christians. Though other religious groups could rent the facility, Christians were denied access. Now, I'm always interested to hear of stories of persecution, not because I'm sick in the head, but I, I, I think particularly um, when it comes to persecution from outside the church to the church, okay, I find that interesting. And the reason why I'm interested in that is because I find it interesting in the way that the church responds to that or reacts to that. Now, because of the religious freedoms that were at stake in this case, the church decided that whether you agree with this or not is by the by, but the church decided to take the school court, the school council to court, okay, for the right to use the school building, just like anybody else. Now, the case worked its way up, all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, in America, which ruled that the church 
or churches must have equal access to the rental of public buildings just like anyone else. Now, when this news story was heard on the radio, one presenter at the time uh, commented and said, uh, and I quote, during the legal battle, Christians showed remarkable unity. In partition drives, phone calls to members of Congress, and prayer, Christians that normally divide over doctrine and other issues united and pulled together. Once united, the family of God drove the secular wolf away from their door. That was written uh, in, a, in, a, in a newspaper in America. Now, I think that's great. That's fantastic. A, a huge answer to many believers' prayers. And I think... In reading that, it makes me think, well, we're obviously very good at fighting our corner, right? Standing our ground and, and, and fending off the devastation which comes our way from those who oppose the gospel. And of course, we have an almighty God, don't we, who really did fight that battle for them and for us. But I have met many, many Christians who have been wounded in action. Let's put it that way. And they weren't hurt by unbelievers or those outside the church seeking to cause pain, but by brothers and sisters in Christ, from those inside the church family. Wounds caused by people we count as friends are the most painful of all, aren't they? I've heard the illustration even recently, and I've used it myself, so I apologize if, you, if you've heard this before, but if somebody was to walk past me in the street and call me fat, I'd think, I don't know, I might go red, I'd be embarrassed. I'd probably think about it for that evening <laughs> while I was eating my dinner and getting seconds. Um, but if that was my mum, I'd be really hurt. Do you know what I mean? Because those who are closer to you, it means a lot more. It hurts a lot more than somebody who doesn't even know you. Now, think about what happened when the opposition from outside the church came in Texas. What happened? Well, Christians from all over the world heard the cry of other churches. They heard the cry of the, the body of Christ, if you like, from across the world Believers poured out their support, their efforts, their prayers. In fact, whenever a tax springs uh, from outside the church, the effects are these. Christians pray more. They give more. They serve more. They trust God and trust one another more than ever before. In short, we draw together. Isn't that interesting? But when attacks and wounds come from inside the church, the exact opposite happens. We become weary, we become guarded, we pray less, we give less, we serve less, and we trust each other less. We sometimes even trust God less. When we experience the pain of hurt inflicted by other Christians, we can sometimes end up feeling let down by God. Wounds that happen to us from within God's family have devastating consequences. They leave us with open wounds, an inability to relate to people sometimes. And not only that, but they leave us with gaping holes in our relationship with God. Trust that's been built up sometimes over many years can take a long time to restore. And if we're honest about this, I'm sure we've all heard of, if not experienced it personally in our own lives, disappointments or bad experiences with other Christians which have been so painful that they leave the church for good. Whether, you know, some walk out of the church, not only of that church, but out of church and away from God forever. I personally know of pastors who have left the church that they were leading and never stepped foot in a church again. And that's why Paul deals with this situation here in chapter 4, because wounds that happen to us within God's family have devastating effects. 
And so we need to know how to deal with them. And we must remember that God sent Jesus to make people, uh, to, to, to bring us to God, yeah, to bring us together to him. And he's planted us all here to support one another, pray for each other, serve one another. God sent Jesus so that you and I and all other believers can be part of the body of Christ. And we heard that so perfectly this morning. So why is this all so important? Why does it matter how we love and support one another? Let's get into this passage together. So verse 17 of chapter 3. Paul says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul says, watch me and do as I do. Right? And, and don't only imitate me, but imitate those who imitate Christ or emulate Christ. See, if you see Jesus reflected in the way that somebody loves, in the way that somebody cares, in the way that somebody forgives, then imitate that. Be more like Jesus in everything you do and allow that to, to reflect in your relationships, your own personal relationships. But we have enemies. There are some who, verse 18, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And we've seen already this evening how a church should respond uh, and often does when enemies of the cross, enemies of Christ attack us. We pray more, we give more, we serve more, we support more, we grow deeper in our faith. In those moments of persecution, it's incredibly uncomfortable. It creates anxiety and stress, especially in the leaders of the church. But it's during those times where we grow in our dependence and relationships, not just with each other, but with God, isn't it? Haven't you known that in your own personal life? That it's through the hardships that you have grown closer to the Lord. You see, we have the knowledge that God is using it to grow and to shape us. And we were reminded last week that even the rooms of persecution are what? Do you remember from last week? Every room is a joy room. Right? We rejoice in our times of suffering. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The reality is that we are so quick to see how God uses persecution from outside the church. And we stand together in support in, in whatever way we can. But when it comes to difficulties within the church... What's the reaction? It's so easy to see, isn't it? When we see persecution from outside the church towards us, we see it and we see, oh, God is, God is going to use that. Don't worry. You know, God is, God is in that situation. He's in that circumstance. The moment we have a conflict within the church, what do we do? We're not so quick to say how God is going to use it, are we? I think we run away, sometimes we ignore it, we hide under a blanket, hope it blows over quickly. The reality is it pulls us apart. But we should rejoice because God created his body of believers so that we could befriend one another and stay faithful together, encouraging, comforting, and loving each other. He created this body so that we could live life to the full and that any in need would have their needs met. And Paul's concern needs to be our concern too. And it comes down to this. When, when the church does what God created it to do, when we demonstrate through our love and our unity the glory of God's love, God mobilizes and strengthens us to change the world through the gospel of Christ. Is it any wonder why Satan, the destroyer, wants to tear Christ's body apart limb from limb, limb from limb? It makes sense that one of the most successful tactics that Satan has is to invade God's own family. 
If he can separate us from our brothers and sisters in Christ, whether it, actual physical distance, maybe it's possible to blunt the effect that we have in the world. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28 and 29, uh, Luke records the Apostle Paul's words to the elders in the church in Ephesus. And when he was warning them to look out for men who wanted to pull believers back into legal bondage and uh, an obedience to the Jewish law, which is what we looked at last week together, where faith was placed in our own ability to achieve what God sees as perfection rather than actually we're just relying on the Lord Jesus. You know, putting their trust, their faith in bodily circumcision rather than faith in Jesus' perfection for our righteousness before God. But Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul says this. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. The church is so precious, friends, isn't it? So precious. It cost God in Christ his life. Verse 29 says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Paul warns them that attacks on individuals in the body would come from the most dangerous and probably least expected place of all, and that's within. And James makes it clear that the, the, distraction, the destruction of the church really is the work of Satan when he writes in James 3 verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, this is not that which comes from above, but is earthly and demonic. In fact, James chapter 2, all the way through to chapter 4, are filled with things which wound Christians and cause disunity in the body of Christ. Things like uh, favoritism and quarrels and conflicts and speaking against one another and, and judging. And he, he, he addresses all of those issues in James chapter 2 to 4. Now, let me be clear about one thing here, well, about everything, hopefully, but about this thing. I'm not saying that Christians who hurt or disappoint or betray you is the wolf or even a wolf. It's not what I'm saying, because a brother or sister lets you down, even if it was intentionally, that doesn't mean that he or she is demonic, as is described here, but Pastor Jonathan covered that last Sunday, didn't he? Last Sunday morning about, about dem demonic influence in our lives. Um, so that's not what I'm saying, necessarily. But the problem comes when Christians sit by, hoping that other Christians will change and make the church what it should be, you know, if only they would do something, or if only they would do that, or if only they would see this. Just sit back. Is that what God intends us to be? Because if nothing changes and we continue to complain and ultimately withdraw, if not with our physical presence, then our emotional and our inner commitments, then we'll lose out, and so does the body of Christ. So you'll notice there in verse 18, Paul says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. It's with tears that Paul writes about the enemies of Jesus. It's painful for Paul to know that there are people who are against Christ. Because he knows the joy and the freedom of knowing Jesus himself. And the enemies of the gospel, if they remain enemies, will never experience the unending love and acceptance, unconditional love of God. 
It's painful for Paul to think of those people. I think Paul is also upset because he knows that in verse 19 he says, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. You see, their highest thoughts and pleasures are what satisfies the physical body, there and then. Good food, comfort, sex, and setting their hope on and joy on earthly things, which will fade away. And Paul warns that their end will be destruction. But chapter 3, verse 20, he says, there's the contrast here, you see. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from heaven we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So as citizens of heaven, as children of God, we await Jesus' return. And when Jesus returns, everything will be made new, right? including our lowly bodies, as he says there, which will be made like his glorious body. We worship a restoring and healing God. He will one day take everything which is wrong, everything which is rotten and decaying, and everything which hurts physically and emotionally and make it new, make it perfect, eternally. And I believe that God created each of us with certain longings that can only be fulfilled in healthy physical families i don't know if you've thought about this before but he, he you know there's like there's like a, if, if somebody lives alone there's a longing isn't there right there's a longing for i know s- several guys my age who don't have a partner don't have children and are starting to think as they look around at their peers, you know, is it too late for me now? You know, maybe I've left it too late. Maybe I'm never going to find the one. There's a desire there to, to be in relationship, to have a family, to, to, have, to be loved, but also to love. And I think that God has made us all with that desire. But that desire can only be fulfilled in the church, in the family of Christ. I think it's a wonderful thing that God not only designed us to have that desire, but he gave us the ability to satisfy that desire. I think that's wonderful. He didn't just create those longings within us. He created the setting in which those longings could be satisfied. And in the case of our spiritual longings and desires, the setting is the church. Among the sheltering walls of God's living people. Now, a few years ago on the news, there was a story which broke about uh, the tragedies which were happening at the time in the Philippines, um, where many children were sadly being abandoned in the streets. And I don't know if you remember this, but it was a terrible thing. But in the midst of all that tragedy and pain, there was hope. Um, One newspaper wrote this. There where cameramen all stood at the entrance to the ramp leading to the aircraft parked on the taxiway, all waiting the arrival of someone very special. One small boy, only 13 months old, had been abandoned to le- and left to starve in a rubbish-filled alleyway in Manila. That's where church workers had found the child. They took him to a Christian orphanage and called him Joe. There was a family who had dreamt about opening their home and their hearts to this or to an abandoned little boy, right? They wanted to be parents. And the opportunity arose for them as a Christian family to open their home, open their hearts to this little boy. And now on the news, you could see the faces, their faces of these new 
expectant parents as they waited to see their child for the first time. And the, the news article continued. It said, the doors opened and out stepped a woman carrying in her arms the cutest little boy, baby Joe. The new pa- I know it's hard to imagine, isn't it? <laughs> You're imagining a baby with my face. With a beard. <laughs> Sorry. I shouldn't have given you that image. I've ruined it. But the new parents rushed over to take him into their arms. Uh, A banner that they had brought with them read, Welcome to our family. That poor little boy, who could well have died in that dirty alleyway, was saved and brought safely into a loving family. He he would now live and grow up surrounded by love, not just from his immediate family, but also from the church family that he would be brought into. Getting a new family is a big deal, isn't it? Why do people cheer and cry and celebrate the sight of a new family? There's, you know, whenever anyone, anyone in our family has a baby, it's all over Facebook and Instagram and you get pictures on the forums and... You know, this is how they're doing, and this is what they've done. They've just dribbled for the first time. It's, you know, it, all that sort of stuff is so exciting, and we celebrate it as a family. We, we, you know, we're filled with joy about it. Why do we do that? <laughs> you know, I think whether it's an aircraft terminal, like it was in the case of Baby Joe, or in a hospital ward where you give birth, or in the back of a taxi rush into the hospital. Wherever it is, I think we celebrate those moments because inside we realize that it's the same longing and desire that we each have. We see ourselves in the story, don't we? We all tussle with life. We all, life's confusing and, and, and hard sometimes. We hope to find a safe place to to know, let down our guard, be ourselves, let go of our struggles, and simply just belong, just as we are. We long to find people who will take us into their lives and care about us, to encourage us, to teach us, to lovingly help us see our weaknesses and, and, and constructively help us learn how to grow stronger. We long to find people who want our company the fact is that when we become Christians we are all like baby Joe coming out of the stinking darkness of this world wanting to be taken into a spiritual home a spiritual family where we're free to live free to make mistakes as we learn and grow stronger through the support of the family A healthy biological family living in the way that God intended offers that safety and offers that love and support and help and encouragement and understanding to all of its members, doesn't it? Nobody has to prove themselves to each other. There's acceptance and there's unconditional love as well. When I was growing up, my Oma, so my my grandmother, she's Dutch, um, on my mum's side, I remember her telling me this a lot, which, anyway, I'll tell you what she said first. Um, She used to tell me that, me and my brother, my older brother, um, she used to tell me that she'd still love us if we murdered someone. How many of your grandparents told you that? Right? Some of you who know my grandmother will think, yeah, okay, I can get that. But what does that say about me as a child, that she actually anticipated that being a reality? Um, anyway, by the by, she always used to say that, but that's the sentiment behind it was that I have unconditional love for you. That's what she was saying, just in her Dutch ways. At the time, I didn't understand it. I used to just think, all right, well, if I killed someone, she'll be all right. She'll still like me. That's, I literally took it literal. But really, underneath that was just that, that unconditional love. I'll love you even if you murder someone. But 
Likewise, I suppose the church, when it's living the way that God intended, offers these free gifts too, doesn't it? In fact, the church is supposed to provide the same safety and grace-filled relationships at even a deeper level than what it is for a family, a genetic family. Because we represent Jesus, don't we? We're citizens of heaven, as he says in verse 20. Hope draws us to Jesus, not only to find an eternal solution for our sin problem, but finding a solution to our loneliness and to our grief and confusion and healing to our wounds and hurts, including those that are emotional. Hope makes us look for a place where our soul can be safe at home. And that will be fulfilled in eternity, perfectly but it will also be here. And what is the sign which hangs outside the the spiritual place of worship? For those of you who who know me, you know I love John 17, where Jesus' high priestly prayer. And this often is something that I think about when I'm thinking about John 17. Um, about like a banner over a church, if you like. He says in uh, verse 23, so John 17, verse 23, Jesus prayed that his church may be perfected in unity and through it that the world may know that God sent Jesus. I always like that, perfected in unity, (laughs) as a banner over a church. Being perfected in unity means more than just agreeing on stuff, doesn't it? Agreeing on truths of the Bible. It it, it comes from a oneness of heart which emanates from knowing Jesus and being united in him. It includes mutual support and, and mutual encouragement in growth and discipleship and help in weakness. It's all of those things. That's what it looks like to be perfected in unity. See, we as God's children, we've been called to a living, or to be living, breathing examples of Christ in the world. How's that going? God's kingdom is made up of many different people from many different tribes and many different nations. And as this church in Philippi, you know, if you think about the, the, if you go back into Acts and, and have a look at, how this church was formed. You've got, you've got prison officers, prison guards. You've got ex-demon-possessed fortune tellers. You've got wealthy merchants in purple cloth, uh, clothes, whatever. You know, it's a complex mix of people. But they all have the same goal. Living for Christ. And if there's something which is stopping us from looking like Jesus, even in your private life at home, it's damaging the church and it needs to be repented of. And that's what, that, that's, a, I think, an important point. Right? We're wrong when we think that our personal sin doesn't affect the church family. It does. What goes on in my heart and in the privacy of your home does have an effect on the church because it has an effect on your relationship with God. If it's habitual sin, if there's resentment, if there's unforgiveness, if there's bitterness, if there's sin, it must be dealt with. Jesus has already dealt with it. He's paid the price for it. We just need to repent of it. Turn our backs on that and look to Jesus because we cannot and must not allow Satan to gain a foothold, even if it's a tiny one. We strive forward, united together as a church, as God's people, living the same way that Jesus did, doing what Jesus did, always pointing people to God the Father, the giver of life. Jesus forgave those who persecuted him. He prayed for those who crucified him. And he paid the price for our sins and forgave us so that we can forgive those who sin against us. 
The message puts chapter 4, verse 1 in this way. My dear, dear friends, I love you so much. I want the very best for you. You make me feel so much joy and fill me with so much pride. Don't waver. Stay on track. Dwell in God. The world is a crazy place at the moment. It's a crazy place at the moment. I barely go a day without someone mentioning how warped, I won't necessarily use that word, but how warped things are. And, and it's not just Christians saying it either. Everything which is pushed in our faces is asking for acceptance, it's asking for grace, and it's asking for support. All the marches in the cities throughout our nation The festivals, the TV shows, the news outlets, the courts, the governments, everything is begging for our acceptance, our grace, and our support. But the truth is this, even the greatest support and the most significant acceptance which can be offered by the world for living a life of sin is only ever slavery. That's the pinnacle of it. That's what they're fighting for, slavery. Because if the world's support of its ungodly attributes is is as good as it gets, it's like chapter 3, verse 3 says, there is zero confidence which can be found in the flesh. Whatever gain you can get from the world, it's counted as feces when compared to knowing Christ. And that's it. The so-called freedoms and support which the world is pushing for are like those trophies that Paul mentions in chapter 3, that he says are nothing. You know, those achievements, I I think I mentioned this last week, but those achievements and status symbols and trophies and things like that are what got him recognised, what got him listened to. And you see, when you look at the, the world and its lists, The achievements, the status symbols, the trophies, the titles, the genders, right? Things which gain the respect of others, but those things are so fragile and so fleeting. And I know I've gone over on time, I just want to say this point. The fact is, the highest rate of teen suicide in our country is among those who are of the LGBTQ plus community. They are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers. Every 45 seconds, someone takes their own life from that community in our country. And while there may be many contributing factors which lead them to take that decision, the acceptance and support they have is not enough. It's a fact. I read a massive article on it yesterday. The acceptance and support they have is not enough. The unity which the world provides is never enough. But as people of God's kingdom, we're here to offer godly unity through Christ, through acceptance, through love and support. So different. Listen, friends, I'll close with this. If there's a conflict between you and a brother and sister in Christ, I urge you to resolve it between you. If you need the elders' involvement, speak to me. Speak to Jonathan. Speak to Trevor. Speak to anyone who you know and trust. And reconcile that relationship. Because reconciliation is God-honoring. It's God-glorifying. And it's so important. Amen. Our last song together is uh, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me.